and it is indeed yours. Whether you expected it this morning as you rolled out of bed or not, God is on time and gives to you all that you need. For Christ was put on the cross for your transgressions and raised so that you may have eternal life. And this is indeed yours. Your sins are forgiven. Death is behind you. And now that you have God's forgiveness, you are freed. You are freed now to truly love. And this is what Christ makes of you, great lovers. Amen. Do you ever get tired of hearing this, that Christ has died for your forgiveness, that your sins are forgiven for Christ's sake? Does this get tiring? Well, if it does, if you do get tired of this, I suspect it's because you have not come to grips with the enormity of your need for forgiveness. You may be like the Pharisee in Luke 7 and believe that while you have a few blemishes here or there, you're actually doing pretty well. I mean, for goodness sake, you made it to church uh, on the morning of the great blizzard. <laughs> here you are, and I in fact say thank you <laughs> and congratulations. I give this to you, but now God says, not enough. <laughs> Kind of sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? I have a hard time even saying it, but this is the case. We, in fact, are trained in our society, like most societies, it's a virtue-rewarding society. We reward those who do well. And those who don't do well, well, they don't get as much rewards, if any. Uh, our culture is quick even to shame those who don't measure up to the level of virtue that we expect. And so we're trained to cover up our sins, our shortcomings, maybe even ignore them. And perhaps they won't be noticed by others. Even last night among our children, and, and I can, as I've mentioned before, I can attest to this with my own kids. Um, among our children's sermon, uh, some children weren't so sure that they needed to be forgiven, uh, but they certainly could forgive others. Well, this, we're halfway there. Uh, but this is kind of how we grow up. We learn this from an early age. My kids are no different. They want to hide their shortcomings. So maybe they can escape uh, any shame. But this is not the economy Jesus is teaching or showing or giving in the gospel today. Scripture teaches us, and you may recognize this from uh, our confession that comes out of the uh, LBW. God who is righteous and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sins. That's from 1 John. I suspect that when we think too lowly of God's forgiveness, it's because we haven't fully grasped our own situation, the enormity of our sin. For really, who wants to dwell on this? Who wants to dwell on this? Far better to dwell on how well we're doing, maybe how well we love our neighbors, or how successful we've been in our lives. That seems much more positive. Here is our virtue, we think. But Jesus says today, he or she who is forgiven little, loves little. We heard how Jesus went to the house of the Pharisee whose name was Simon, and you have to give Simon some credit for inviting Jesus over. Most of the Pharisees were keeping Jesus at arm's length. They weren't happy with him. But here Simon wanted to learn something, get to know this man. Yet, enter the woman. She approaches Jesus. She's a publicly known sinner, Luke says. And I suspect this means she is someone who's been used and abused in society, as those who are publicly known as sinners often are. Perhaps she's used and abused others as well in the process. But here she is. Barring into the Pharisee's house, she makes quite a scene with Jesus. She stands behind him, Luke says. She washes his feet with her tears. She kisses his feet. She puts costly ointment. Matthew, St. Matthew tells us it's worth a lot of money, this ointment that she puts on his feet. And she dries his feet with her hair. Even by today's standards, this is quite a display. She's a heap of emotions. And so Simon, the Pharisee, is embarrassed that this was happening in his own house. In a culture, 
in Jesus' day where a husband could divorce his wife for merely showing her hair in public, if you can imagine that. This was scandalous. And it rendered Jesus, and perhaps the Pharisee's house, and perhaps the Pharisee himself as unclean. How could Jesus allow this? The Pharisee asked. This was no prophet. But Jesus was not offended. This woman needed him. He recognized this. He invited her to be there. And as we explore this story a little further, I'm going to invite you to join me in a hymn. Now, it's not a hymn that we sing every day. It probably is heard mostly during Lent. But it's a hymn that Martin Luther wrote, uh, and it paraphrases the psalm that we heard read, Psalm 130, and it is a perfect hymn for this gospel lesson. Uh, as you, it's hymn 600, so I invite you to take your hymnals out. Um, I know, I think we have the words on the screen as well, but I want you to take a look at the music as we sing it. Um, it's a bit of a mournful tune, as Luther's hymns could be. But as the melody line goes on for each verse, it ends with a major chord. And the words of this hymn show hope in the midst of difficulty. We'll sing each verse of this hymn um, verse by verse, and I'll, I'll invite you for each verse. And I'll have Jim play the uh, melody line first, and then we'll join with verse 1. Hymn 600. culture then and now which encourages us to show our only our best sides, our shiny sides, to display our trophies and our accomplishments. This display that the woman showed was very public repentance. It was embarrassing to the Pharisee and probably others there, but it was moving to Jesus. It was truth, and it showed great faith. Somehow this woman knew that of all her history of sin, of all the glares that she received, avoidance, shame she likely received in public, here was one who could change everything for her. And as Dave mentioned, and as we are reminded of the Bihar Project today, reminded of many women in Bihar who are greatly affected by this project, who perhaps have similar stories. We don't really know the backstory of this woman other than that she was in tough times. But we think of women in our day in India and in our own community, and men as well, who need this change as well, who need Christ's forgiveness. In fact, we need this. So let's sing verse 2 together. You send our full of grace. You crown our lives with favor. All our good works are done in vain. Without our Lord and Savior, we praise you. Save us from the grip of death. 
Luther gets to a really shocking discovery that all of our good works are done in vain without Jesus. Now, not in vain for our neighbors, for God will use these works. But for us, they are worth nothing. Jesus knows the Pharisee's heart in this story. He knows the shame that the Pharisee feels in what he's just seen. And so he tells the story of the two slaves who owe a debt. One about $7,500, the other about $75,000 in today's money. Which one will, will love the forgiving money lender more, Jesus asks. And Simon answers, the one who's been forgiven more, of course. And then Jesus says, look at the hospitality this woman has shown me in your house. You gave me none of these things, he says to Simon, but she has shown great love. Because she has been forgiven much, she forgives much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. What a strange economy Jesus introduces, that we are not to lead with our virtue, but we are to come to him with our sin so that we may know true forgiveness. That is virtue. It is Jesus' virtue. And we'll sing about it again with verse 3. In you alone, O God, we hope, and not in our own merit. We rest our fears in your good word and trust your Spirit, your promise keeps us strong and sure. We trust the cross, your signature inscribed upon our temples. When the forgiveness of Christ comes, as it now comes, it comes as a new day, a new morning. Perhaps a plowed driveway, ready for you to back out into a glisteningly smooth street. This is how forgiveness comes. Luther writes about this in our fourth verse. The good word of Jesus has appeared to you now, who have been struggling with your unbelief, perhaps with the sins of others against you, or maybe your own sins having hurt those around you. With you trying so hard to be good enough, as we all try, it is unavoidable, after all. Now you know that Jesus' word takes all of this away and gives you pure peace and pure righteousness. Let's sing about this morning coming in verse 4. My soul is waiting for you, Lord, as one who wounds for morning. No watcher waits with greater hope than I for your returning. I hope as Israel in the Lord sends redemption through the word. Praise God for grace and mercy. So we end with that major note in a largely minor key. But there is a major note of ending for our story in the gospel. For this woman goes away in God's peace. And the rest of the people there, the Pharisee too, who knows what happened to them. But they receive a word of truth as well. That they need this forgiveness as much as the woman, though they don't realize it. And now you too, and me as well, we need this. And now it is ours. It is ours. So do not tire of this word of forgiveness, my brothers and sisters. I know it is tempting to place our faith and worth in what we do and what we give, and what we accomplish. But this is our sin, as it was Simon's sin, to trust these things, 
Now God will use all of these things, and we give thanks for this. God will use them for our neighbors in need. But outside of Christ, they are nothing for us. He who is forgiven little loves little. But now I tell you, you are not forgiven little. You are not forgiven little, but you are forgiven much. This, of course, means you have much to be forgiven for. God knows this. But you are forgiven much. It also means that now you will love much. You will be great lovers in Christ. Without regard for your own self-image, for your own self-righteousness, it has been taken right away from you, even now. Because you are forgiven much, you will love much without even realizing it. For that is what faith looks like. You will love much without taking credit for it, without worrying about whether you've given too much, for you have been forgiven much. Your history, your greatest hits, your lowest lows have all been taken now by Christ. Death itself has been defeated in this way. So you have nothing to fear. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Amen.